we depend on you, God. You are the victor, the conqueror, God. The mighty Prince of Peace. Nothing escapes your control, Lord, with your mighty hand. You set nations in place. You are our reward, God. Everything that we live for, Lord, all else just falls away, God. There is simply just nothing else worthy as you, Lord. We're here in your presence and we just acknowledge your greatness, your sovereignty, your love. We sing, we give our praise to you, and we bow before you, our reward. Just take 
Amen. Have a seat this morning. Well, good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. Thanks for coming in. I want to welcome all of you that are here into worship at Centerpoint and all of you that are online watching us as well, whether you're on site or online, thank you for joining us on a very special Father's Day Sunday. It's glad to, we're glad to have you here in for worship. My name's Tony. I'm the youth and outreach pastor here, and I want to invite everyone to connect with us this week. Now, if you're new here in the building, we'd love for you to use the contact card. You'll find that card in the back of the seat right in front of you. And you can drop this card off at one of the giving boxes that you'll see on your way out in those exits. Uh, we'd love to connect with you and learn about you more. And we'd also love to pray for you and your family and loved ones. You can use the other side of the card, the response side. And we pray for you every single week. We love receiving these. Now, if you are online or you're more electronically inclined, there's um, electronic ways that you can do that as well. You can download the free-to-use Echo Prayer app. Uh, go to the feed section of that app and search for our church name, Centerpoint Community Church, and you'll see all of the prayer requests that come through our church office right there to your mobile device. Really easy to use, really practical. We'd love for you to use that. And then on our website, if you click on the prayer tab, you can submit a prayer request for the online prayer wall. In fact, one of you did that this morning. Thank you for that. I already got that notification. We can pray for you and see that publicly and click on alerts for you to receive that we prayed for your request. Uh, use those ways. We believe in prayer. We love connecting you with you that way. I want to remind you, uh, we've changed things up. Obviously, the church looks different. We're not passing offering plates anymore. Uh, those boxes are there at the back. You can do that on your way out. You can put something in an envelope, whether it's there from the seat there, or there's some blank ones, extras at the back. If you came prepared to give physically here on site, if you want to do that online, you can do that at our website, centerpointarvada.org slash give. There's also info on the envelopes on how to do just that. I've got two specific announcements for you today, and we'll continue in worship. First one is about an on-site church event happening very soon. I haven't been able to tell you that in months. I'm so excited. Three weeks from today, on Sunday, July 12th, on 6 p.m. in the evening, we are having our annual summer gathering for ice cream and a car show out on the church lawn. It is going to look a little bit different, like most things are these days, but the event is happening. We're going to give you more deals, uh, details over the next coming Sundays. But it's coming up in three weeks. It's going to be a lot of fun outside, having a blast uh, on July 12, 6 p.m. That is coming up very soon. For our student ministry, if you have students that are in 6th through 12th grade for Fusion, uh, we are meeting tonight, 6 p.m., for our microwave night. It's one of our annual summer traditions. Have you ever wondered what would happen if you put that one thing in the microwave and turned it on? You get to find out tonight. As long as it's not metal or living or once living, bring it with you and you can, seriously, YouTube some uh, microwave experiments. It's a lot of fun. Parents, don't worry. It's, it's outdoors. It's safe in a controlled environment. Uh, we don't let them be up close to it. But come with us. Come back tonight at 6 p.m. for youth group. We would love to have you there. That is all the specific announcements I have for today. But today is a special day. It's Father's Day. So I want to say happy Father's Day to all the dads in the room, to the dads that are watching with us online. I want to say happy Father's Day to my dad, Steve. To say I love you to my kids, Jordan, Diego, Jade, and Asher. I love being your dad. For all the dads, we've got a video queued up just for you. Watch the screens. I hope you enjoy. You have to play a lot of roles. Hey, 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 don't eat that. Don't tap on the brain. Okay, whoa, whoa, Lodi. All right. Oh, you're good. Take, take a left, turn left, turn left, turn left. When a man loves a woman, he... Honey! All righty, sweetie. This time I want you to concentrate and focus on the ball. You got this. Sweetie, your date's here. Two weeks, no TV, no phone. This is my door in my house. I told you not to slam it. You get the door back when I say you get the door back. I told you before, don't you slam the door in my house. I told you. Hey, knock it off. Don't let me turn this car around. I'll do it. What are you wearing? No, I, you're not going anywhere looking like that. Go on back upstairs and put some clothes on. Okay. Oh! Got it. Ooh, sweetie, open the door. Get the door. Get the door. Get the door. Get the door. Open the door. Open the door, sweetie. Open. 
Bye. And Jesus steps in and stops everybody before they start throwing the rocks. And he says, let he who's without sin throw the first stone. You do all of this knowing that one day you will get fired because we all get fired. But by the grace of God, you might get hired back to be a consultant. Hey, sweetie, what's up? Father's Day. It's so fun to think about those funny moments. Will you stand with us? Our God is our Heavenly Father. His love is always there. No matter what your earthly experience is with your earthly father, right? Good, bad, and different. Uh, we have a Heavenly Father we can run to you, will not let us down, his love is constant, his presence is always there for us, his love, his provision is always, always there.
full of grace. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. We love you, and the saints love you, and sing your praise this morning. Good morning, beloved of God, and happy Father's Day to all of you dads out there. Did I tell you the story of the magic penny? Probably not. Here's how it goes. After putting their three-year-old son, Brian, to bed, his parents heard muffled sobs from his room. Rushing back in, they found the child crying hysterically. He told his parents that he had accidentally swallowed a penny and he was sure he would die. The father, in an attempt to calm him down, took out a penny from his pocket and pretended to pull it out of little Brian's ear. Well, the child was thrilled and he stopped crying at once. In a flash, the boy snatched the penny from his dad's hand, swallowed it, cheerfully demanded, do it again, daddy. Oh, such a moment for a dad. Just goes to show dads do have awkward moments from time to time. But being a dad has its joys, too. For me, being the father of three fine young men is one of my greatest joys. Being your pastor is also a joy, most of the time. <laughs> Two weeks ago, if you were around, we began a new sermon series entitled Relationship Essentials, Living Out the One Another's of Scripture. The One Another's of the New Testament are treasured principles for how to live with each other in harmony. It seems to me in our world these days, it's in desperate need of these principles for how to get along. Amen to that? The first one, if you remember, that we unpacked was not passing judgment on one another concerning each other's preferences. Folks, there is so much conflict and division these days over personal preferences instead of principles, the principles based, that are based upon truth. And not just any truth, but God's truth has found in his word. If you haven't watched, heard, or even read that message, you can do so, and I would encourage you to do so, by checking out our website, centerpointarvada.org, or you can call the church office and we can send you a DVD or a manuscript of that message. Today we are focusing on two more one another attitudes that seem to go hand in hand. They are be kind to one another and forgive one another. But before we go any further, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we've entered into your presence this morning with the purpose of giving you praise and thanks and adoration. We pray that our words and our hearts have reflected a love for you and a gratitude for your kindness and for the way that you've cared for us this past week. We look forward now to unpacking some more of your word. I pray that it would speak into our minds, into our hearts, and allow us to be set free from our own persuasions and to be channeled into yours. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. How wonderful it is to be the recipient of someone's thoughtfulness, especially something that is unexpected. One evening, a couple of weeks into the COVID-19 pandemic, we heard a knock at the door. It was our next door neighbor holding a bag of paper towels and 
toilet paper. Yes, toilet paper. He asked if we were okay and could we use these items. We said absolutely. We thanked him for his kindness. A few weeks later, I was talking to another neighbor and he asked me if the aforementioned neighbor had come by. I said he had, and he said that he had sent him our way. He was the source behind the kindness. My wife, Jamie, has that kind of influence over me. The attitude of kindness often begins with her, and before long, I've caught the vision, and then we together put it into action. That tells me that the attitude of kindness, the motive to act, doesn't always have to come from the person exhibiting the kindness. It could begin with someone else who has influence over another. That means kindness can be contagious. As your pastor, I would like to think or hope that I have that kind of influence over you. But frankly, that is not God's best. You would be doing something for me. It would be so much better, so much better if you were under the influence of God's Holy Spirit who moved in your heart to practice an act of kindness to those around about you. That's the kind of kindness that our world needs to see, needs to hear, needs to feel. And maybe, just maybe, our example of kindness will influence others to acts of kindness too. The Apostle Paul spoke to these issues in his letters to the first century churches. I invite you to turn to the New Testament book of Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 31. Here's what Paul wrote. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Kindness does not just happen naturally in human relationships. Man's natural tendency is to sin. And the natural tendency of sin is to grow into greater sin. If not checked, our inner sins of, as Paul says, bitterness, wrath, and anger will inevitably lead to outward sins of clamor, slander, and malice. Bitterness reflects an attitude that harbors resentment and holds grudges while rejecting reconciliation. Wrath has to do with a deep-seated rage that fails to subside. Anger is an uncontrollable temper with explosive outbursts. Clamor, we hear a lot of clamor in our world today, is the loud shout or outcries that disrupt peace and cause confusion. Slander is the ongoing destroying of another person through gossip. And finally, malice is the harming of others through intentional acts of evil. These particular sins involve conflict between person to person, believer to unbeliever, and worse yet, believer to believer. These are sins, my friends, that break fellowship. They destroy relationships. They weaken the church, and they tarnish its testimony before the world. When an unbeliever sees Christians acting like the rest of society, the church is flawed in their eyes, and they're convinced all the more to resist the claims of the gospel. This must not be. Consistent with Paul's theme in this passage of putting off the old and putting on the new, he exhorts us to replace these six hateful vices with three loving virtues. These, these are the graces that God has shown us, and they are the gracious virtue, virtues that we are to show others. God did not love us, choose us, and redeem us because we were deserving. He did so 
because he is gracious. So what does it mean to be kind to one another? Three observations. First of all, being kind is acting graciously toward others just as God has with us. If God is so gracious to us, how much more should we be kind to those around about us, to fellow sinners like us, to one another who believe in Jesus? You know, the ancient Greek, Greeks defined kindness as the disposition of mind which thinks as much as his neighbor's concerns as he does his own. It's being concerned with the, the sorrows, the struggles, and the problems of other people as we are our own. It's graciously placing their needs above ourselves without complaint. Being tender-hearted is being compassionate and empathetic toward others who are dealing with hardships. It's offering care and comfort to those who are in need. Second observation, being kind exemplifies the Lord. Paul speaks of God's unconditional kindness in Romans chapter 2. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Jesus goes on. He tells us that we are to be like our heavenly father. He says we are to love our enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And our reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and to the evil. We model the character of our Lord when we are kind to all, even those who don't deserve it. The third observation, being kind is a fruit of the Spirit. Our acceptance of Jesus as our Savior and Lord brings about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Galatians chapter 5 gives us a list of the fruits of the Spirit that should characterize our lives. Paul writes, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Folks, kindness is the evidence of God's spirit at work in our lives. Kindness, as, as well as these other godly qualities, will become part of our lives more and more as we grow spiritually through yielding to the spirit's control and obeying God's word as he gives us instruction through it. Many of you, I'm so grateful to be able to say this, many of you who call Center Point home exhibit this spirit-empowered quality of kindness to which we are all benefactors of. Let's go to the second one another from Ephesians chapter 4. Forgiving one another. Let's be honest. Forgiveness has never been in vogue, even among Christians, as the numerous divisions and conflicts in churches and families attest. How is it can a Christian go for years holding a grudge? As human beings, we are often slow to forgive because we think it appears to ignore justice and restitution. But listen, most of the time, our refusal to forgive doesn't come from some lofty sense of justice, but from self-centeredness. We want to make sure that they get what they deserve or we get what we deserve. How foolish. The New Testament assures us that those who do not forgive, God does not forgive. Paul's inspired words here in Ephesians 4.32 changes the golden rule. We are asked to do unto others as God has done to us. We are asked to do unto others as God has done 
to us. Folks, we show whose we are by the way we act. So what does it mean to forgive? Three observations. Number one, forgiveness is an act of obedience to the Lord. Paul says we are to extend reconciliation to those who have offended or harmed us, just as Christ has forgiven us. Though many people in our world retain the poison of of hatred and unforgiveness in their lives, forgiveness is commanded and is possible through Christ. Second observation. Forgiveness gives the offender what he needs rather than what he deserves. What forgiveness does accomplish is the rejection of bitterness, malice, and revenge. When you forgive, you give that offender their humanity back. When you forgive, you surrender your right to get even. We do not control the actions of others, but in choosing to forgive, we establish control over our own responses. We choose to value the other person despite their offense to us. We choose to desire what is good for them before God. Forgiveness restores relationships or at least it provides a foundation for them to be restored. Listen, though Christ has bridged the gap between us and God so that we are forgiven once and for all, we only experience God's forgiveness in personal and practical ways when we forgive others from day to day. Beloved, we must not allow bitterness to take hold and grow. The third observation, forgiveness is the love of Christ in action. When we forgive, we promise not to keep a record of wrongs suffered. When we forgive, we promise not to gossip about the other person's sins to other people. When we forgive, we promise not to dwell on the offense ourselves. And we promise to seek to restore relationship, fellowship with that forgiven person, with that offender, as far as is biblically possible. Forgiveness is a process. It does not necessarily happen overnight. The nature of the offense and the maturity of the one forgiving will determine the length and the character of the process. But listen, forgiveness is necessary and the process cannot allow bitterness and the resulting hatred to take hold and grow. John Perkins, author of the book, Let Justice Roll Down, tells how he was beaten repeatedly by his inebriated jailers in a Mississippi jail in 1969. Another bigger inmate beat him until he was unconscious as well. Other things were done to him that are too graphic for me to share with you here this morning. But know this, the torture he endured were all the reason one would need to hate. But this is what happened, as John Perkins tells it. The Spirit of God worked on me as I lay on that bed in the jail. An image formed in my mind, the image of Christ on the cross. It blotted out everything else in my mind. This Jesus knew what I had suffered. He understood And he cared because he'd experienced it all himself. This Jesus, the one who brought good news directly from heaven, had lived what he preached. Yet he was arrested and falsely accused. Like me, he went through an unjust trial. He also faced a lynch mob and got beaten. But even more than that, he was nailed to rough wooden planks and killed like a common criminal. 
At the crucial moment, it seemed to Jesus that even God himself had deserted him. The suffering was so great, he cried out in agony. He was dying. But when he looked at the mob who lynched him, he didn't hate them. He loved them. And he prayed God to forgive them. Father, forgive these people, for they know not what they are doing. His enemies hated him. But Jesus forgave. I couldn't get away from that. It's a profound, mysterious truth. Jesus' concept of love overpowering hate. I may not see its victory in my lifetime, but I know it's true. On that bed full of bruises and stitches, God made it true in me. He washed my hatred away and replaced it with a love for the white man in rural Mississippi. I felt strong again, stronger than ever. What doesn't destroy me makes me stronger. I know it's true because it happened to me. As you can see, injustice is nothing new. The solution is the gospel of Jesus Christ that brings love and forgiveness where none existed before. Fellow Christian, the remedy to the unrest in our culture begins with you and me. It's not enough for us to put up with each other, to refuse retaliation. We must truly seek to forgive each other so we can be set free. Brothers and sisters, I want to challenge you here this morning to take every unkind, bitter, or unforgiving thought that you have ever held and try to shape them into something useful. (laughs) Tell me, has your bitterness made you better? Has refusing to be kind or to forgive made you free? Of course not. When we choose to be unkind, resentful, or to withhold forgiveness, we think we are placing some impenetrable shield around our hurting hearts. And yet, our power over the thoughts and actions of others remains limited, and our hearts remain just as fragile. At the end of the day, our lack of kindness, our resentments, or our unforgiveness gains us nothing at all. What do we do? What do we do? We do a little soul searching. On your sermon outline are some helps for us to do just that. The first two steps are questions that are intended to help us take a look, to take stock of where we are on these issues. The first question is this, are you known as a kind and gracious person? Why? Or why not? Secondly, are you harboring unforgiveness and the bitterness it yields? If so, what are you hoping to gain? The next two points direct us to some actions that we can take to remedy our sin. The third question says, ask God to help you develop a zero tolerance toward unkindness, unforgiveness, or resentment. And then invite him to convict you immediately whenever you choose these futile ways of thinking. Satan will try to mess with us and get us to go in that direction. We must ask for God's help to keep us from going that direction. And then the fourth thing is memorize. Memorize Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 to bolster your resolve to avoid unforgiveness, resentment, unkindness, or any of the other things that take our testimony and our spiritual strength away. I hope you will take some time today to seriously work through these four important steps. 
maybe, just maybe, your example and your influence will impact others. My friends, because we're believers, we have received such kindness. We ought to act with kindness to all other people, don't you think? Because we've been forgiven much, we ought to forgive others too. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this moment, for these reminders, how they chip away at the hardness of our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you have come alongside us this morning to help us understand, to to begin to look at things that maybe we've just put aside, that maybe we just don't want to think about, that maybe we just want to, to continue on because we don't want to change. Help us to that end, Lord, to see how you can set us free. We bless you for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. In a moment, Tony's got a few announcements, but I want to thank you for joining us here today, whether you're here in this room or you're in your living room watching this. Either way, our desire is to make a difference in your lives through the love of Christ and the truth of God's word. And please, let us know how we can be of help to you in your spiritual journey. May God bless. Have a great day. And we'll see you right here next week. Tony? Well, again, guys, happy Father's Day to you. For those of you in the building, I want to remind you, we do need you to leave the building itself immediately on your way out. Kind of get a little zippy uh, pace going on on your way out. Hang out outside because we need to turn the building over. Ray is going to fog this room and get it ready for the next service. Um, Each week, we are in need about five or six of you, if you're able and you have a few minutes, um, to stop by the cleaning supply table, uh, pick up an instruction card, and help us wipe down the high contact areas throughout the main level of the building to get ready for the 1030 service. Reminder, the offering boxes, giving boxes are there on your way out. We'd love to have you back next week. Reserve your seat if you can call in advance to the office or go online to use those electronic options all that being said thanks for coming happy father's day to you we will see you next week you are dismissed